head out there. In fact, one of the things we're going to be listening to is um, we're going to be doing a Brian Houston update. And since he's one of these money-grubbing uh, televangelist types, we're going to uh, be playing our Dr. Teeth song when we intro him. But uh, one of the things I've noticed about Brian Houston lately is a marked difference, and I mean a negative difference, in his uh, preaching and teaching. In fact, it, it, it the only way I can describe it, and I hate to sound like, to use the word because it, it sounds like hyperbole, but this is really what I think, is that it's it's satanic. And uh, I, if you have, in fact, the last sermon review that we uh, reviewed here at Fighting for the Faith from Brian Houston was when he appeared at Saddleback Church. And um, it, it was fascinating to watch his manipulation of the biblical text so that he would not have to actually say uh, what the passage said regarding repentance and contrition and forgiveness. Um, and he engaged in a very interesting Bible twist where, you know, he switched translations to the message to kind of skip through the part that had the part about repenting. And then once he got through it, you know, he switched back to the other translation he was using. And it, I mean, it was an, an overt clear strategy on his part to not say what the biblical text says. And so um, I was listening to his uh, the most recent sermon in the Hillsong podcast uh, yesterday, and I noticed that uh, I, I, we're not going to do a full-blown sermon review because it actually the way the that particular podcast lays out, it, it wouldn't make a good uh, full-blown sermon review. But what I noticed in, in this latest one is... A, a like whoa kind of moment. Yeah, sorry, I'm it's sounding like Patricia King, and so yeah, <laughs> you remember when Patricia King would claim when she was getting downloads while she was talking or, or something like that, or the Holy Spirit was nudging her or something, and and so she'd be speaking, and all of a sudden she'd go woo. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, I've been doing this job a little too long. I'm getting my mind's going crazy. But anyway, coming back to the Brian Houston thing, Brian Houston. You all familiar with that uh, that text in the Bible where t Jesus talks about broad is the path that leads to destruction, but narrow is the uh, the path that leads to eternal life. And uh, I mean, if you if I were to go and ask the average Christian on the street, you know, uh, you know, what is that passage talking to? Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the path that leads to life. People, for the most part, I think would say that has something to do with salvation you know like heaven hell eternal life versus eternal damnation you know something to that effect because that's really what that text is about well i'm not going to tell you what brian houston does with it but that's not what he did with it um it was so bizarre and so like i've never quite heard a bible twist like this that uh, I have to uh, play it for you and uh, do a little bit of time teaching today. But, you know, I just want to let you get, kind of give you a heads up. Uh, something's up with Brian Houston. And, and what I mean by that is is that I don't think he's capable of uh, teaching uh, the Bible correctly at all anymore. And, uh, and like, passages that are, to, that would, like, to the average Christian are obvious as to what they're about. He's making points to not teach what those passages are about, but completely recast them in light of uh, his false teaching and uh, word of faith heresy. So it would be fascinating. Uh, you know, it should be fascinating for you to listen to. In fact, let's talk about life threatening. So with that, we're going to dive into the program proper. And since we're doing a money grubbing televangelist update, here is Dr. Teeth and his rendition of money. No kissing, don't want no gal to call me honey. Don't want my name in the hall of fame. Just want a big fat pile of money. Give me that almighty dollar for that lettuce, hear me holler. Give me buckets full of ducats, let me walk around and waller in Mazuma. El dinero, wanna be a millionaire. Give me money, 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 money. I want that green ammunition, that's the stuff for which I'm wishing. Fill my closets with deposits, I'm a demon in addition. Give me shackles, give me pesos, let me see their smiling faces. Money, 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 money. Wanna get me a suit that's made out of oof and whistle for wearing a green. 
I got that monetary itis like speeches like King Midas. Want that golden touch is what I mean. Give me that old double eagle. Want that tender that is legal and financially substantially. Any sum I can and equal. Want a living regal splendor for that loving legal tender. Money, 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 money. Back collector, I'm a paper bill inspector, I'm a savage for that cabbage man to me is golden nectar. Pour that filthy lucre on me, spread those loving germs upon me. Money, 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 money. And if they ever plant trees of enormous urum, I wanna be the guy that they send out to prove. That's Dr. Teeth and his rendition of Money, Money, Money. Yeah, we do that for the uh, televangelist types out here. And by the way, Brian Houston is a huge um, word of faith uh, prosperity preacher out there in uh, Sydney, Australia. So I think that's very appropriate for him as well. Okay, so what we're going to be listening to right now is a snippet, if you would. Not a full-blown sermon review, but a snippet from the uh, recent Hillsong Church podcast, sermon podcast. And the name of the of this, the message, by the way, is Understand the Power Your Words Have on Your Dream. <laughs> I mean, just the name, the, the name of a sermon like that should uh, clue you in that what you're about to hear has absolutely nothing to do with what the Bible actually teaches. Uh, instead, this is a uh, <clears throat> message designed to scratch itching ears, draw a large audience, and bring in lots and lots and lots of money, money, money. But uh, with that, uh, I found it fascinating, the particular Bible twist that uh, Brian Houston engages in. Um, like to the point of like totally missing the entire point of a particular Bible passage. But rather than me telling you about it, let's let Brian Houston explain to us. So without any further ado, here is Brian Houston from his sermon entitled Understand the Power of Your Words or Your Words Have on Your Dream. <clears throat> here we go. I began to speak this morning about destiny definers, specific things that define the path and the destiny of your life. Things that define the path and the destiny of your life. Well, we're off to a great start, aren't we? The kind of things that determine whether or not you fulfill God's potential and God's purpose for your life or take a different path altogether. And I couldn't help but think again tonight when Sanger talked about a young guy so full of zeal and enthusiasm. You know, out of what God's done in his heart at Hillsong, he's already written a sermon for the day when he can preach it. And Joe Garrett spoke about a, a little girl who got so touched that she already had a vision of a multitude worshipping and her leading the worship. And I've got faith to believe that those young people and many, many more like them will fulfill the thing that God's put on their heart. But the reality is it all comes down to specific choices they make and certain things that define our destiny. And the Bible describes two gates and two paths with two very contrasting destinations. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 to 15, spoke about a wide gate that many take that leads to destruction or to death. And on the other hand, he talked about a narrow gate that few take that leads to life. It's a path to death and it's a path to life. Now, so he's quoting the tail end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You know, where Jesus talks about the broad road that leads to destruction and the narrow path that leads to life. So he's referenced it here, but is he talking about heaven and hell? Well, let's listen a little further. They go in different directions and they have very different destinations. You can see those same paths and destinations described right through the scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, the Lord says, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Praise God. That both you and your descendants, the promise for life, if you take that gate and go down that path, is not only for you, but for the generations to come. Whereas if you go the other way and take the path towards the devastation of kingdom purpose, it's... The devastation of kingdom purpose? Take the path of devastation of kingdom purpose? What is that? Sad, but the descendants aren't even mentioned. 
John 10 verse 10, Jesus, same comparison. He says, the thief comes but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I'm coming, you might have life and that you might have it in abundance. Same things. Well, here, Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Obviously in life, we eat the fruit of the words we speak. Death and life, same two paths towards the same destination. And one of the destiny definers described here is our tongue or our words. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 10, if you would please. And right through Proverbs chapter 10, verse after verse after verse describes the contrast between the road to life and the road to death. Death not always meaning that you're actually literally physically dead, not breathing, going blue, decaying. You can be the living dead. Check out the person next to you is not the living dead. Just Okay, so you see what he's doing here? So apparently, and I had no clue that this was the case, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Mark and not Mark but Matthew chapter 7 is teaching that the broad is the road that leads to destruction he's not talking about hell he's talking about well the destruction of kingdom purpose in your life yeah i think we're going to have to open our bibles in fact if you have your bible open up to the gospel of Matthew chapter 7 i'm going to read for a little bit and uh, and see if we can figure out from the context of Matthew chapter 7 as to what Jesus is talking about. In fact, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 23. So if you have your Bible again, Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to be beginning here at verse 13. Here's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now, now the question is, is Jesus talking about um, the, the path that leads to the destruction of your God destiny? Well, let's keep reading and see what he says, because the context will tell us. Verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, They are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits." Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Okay, so notice a few things that are going on here. Um, Jesus is talking about on that day. What would that day be? That's the day of judgment when Christ returns in glory to judge the living and the dead. See, and they people will come up to Jesus on the day of judgment and foolishly point to their their works. Oh, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name? These are religious people, okay? They, they're they out there prophesying, casting out demons. You can think of the Patricia King gang here, you know, doing all these things. And Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Where are they departing? Where are they going? Answer, well, if this is the last day, they're not getting into the kingdom of heaven they're on their way to hell. That's what Jesus is talking about here. But that's not what Brian Houston is doing with his text. He's made this about, well, uh, you not achieving your um, your God destiny, whatever that is. I'm not sure what a God destiny is. But I, I assure you that Matthew 13, talking about broad is the <clears throat> road that leads to destruction, narrow is the path that leads to life, 
That's not talking about whether or not you achieve your God destiny or your or dreams for your life. No, this is talking about whether or not you're going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell. Now, let me come back to verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. He is the one who, you know, my Father who is in heaven. So, <clears throat> what is, okay, you can, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Okay, that's important stuff. So, okay, you don't, trust me when I tell you this, you don't want to end up in hell. You don't want to end up in the lake of fire. So Jesus here is telling us very clearly that uh, just because you've done religious things in the name of Jesus doesn't make you, you know, doesn't mean that you're in, in, okay? Instead, you've got to do the will of the Father. So what is the will of the Father? Well, luckily, we don't have to um, guess on this. We do not have to make this up um, <clears throat> because Scripture actually defines this very clearly. In fact, if you want to flip over to the Gospel of John, um, verse uh, chapter 6, I'm going to uh, point out a few verses in chapter 6 and back up into chapter 3, and you'll kind of lay some of this out here. But uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, I'll start at verse 39. Here's what Jesus says. He says, And this is the will of him who sent me, Okay, this would be the Father, right? Uh, this is the will of the, of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Um, John chapter 6, verse 28. This is what it says. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work, the singular work of God, that you believe in the one whom he has sent, or verse uh, 47 of the same same uh, chapter, verse 6. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ's work alone. Your works do not save you in the slightest. They do not contribute to your sal salvation a bit. And so you want to be doing the will of God, right? It's so that you will be saved, right? Well, it's not something that you do. It's something that's given to you. Belief in him is actually a gift. And this is a this is what Ephesians chapter uh, chapter 2 says very clearly. Let me uh, point this out to you. Ephesians chapter 2. Um <clears throat> I'll start at verse 1 so we get the context here. And you you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among uh, disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let me point this out. Verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is the gift of God. What is the this? When it says this is the gift of God, what's it referring to? The answer is, both grace and faith itself are a gift from God. You are not capable of believing the good news. God actually gives you that belief. And the reason why is because you're born dead in trespasses and sins. And that's why Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. Through the preaching of the gospel, God regenerates you. Through the preaching of law and gospel, you are convicted of your sins and raised to life in Christ and are born from above or born again as uh John chapter uh John chapter 3 says so clearly in fact let me back this up um John chapter 3 verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Okay? So, the good news is that Christ saves sinners and has bled and died for sinners like me and like you, and he gives us faith to believe in him, to trust in him. He regenerates us, raises us from the dead, causes us to be born again, to be born from above, born anew, right? And this is all God's work. And this is all a this is all good news. And this is what is referred, this is what uh, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is referring to about the, the narrow gate versus the wide gate. The narrow gate is the one that leads to eternal life, and Jesus is that gate. The, the broad road that leads to destruction is the one that we're all born on. And Christ rescues and saves us and takes us off of that broad highway and puts us on the path, literally leads us right into his heavenly kingdom. And all of this is by his mercy and his grace. It's not something that you earn or do. It's given to you as a gift. This is what the good news is. But Brian Houston, in this sermon, literally has changed the meaning of that passage and made it about whether or not you achieve your God-given destiny here on earth. And that's not what this passage is about at all. Let's listen a little bit more. Just double check. Look at the key indicators. Like, were they worshiping? Were their hands raised? Did they say amen? Are they smiling? Do they have a Bible? Do they look like they love God? Check they're not the living dead. Check the vitals. You see, you can be alive but dead to God's purpose and God, dead to God's plan. And just those young people I talked about have an awesome future, as does every human being in humankind but the reality is it comes down to whether or not we take the path towards the death of kingdom purpose or the path that breathes life and one of the key issues is our words and here in proverbs chapter 10 it talks about verse after verse gives contrasts and i believe there are specific destiny definers that are themes i spoke of one of them this morning that was integrity the scripture says he who walks in his integrity walks securely and these that theme runs through proverbs 10 and the second one is our conversation our words what's on our lip what comes from our mouth it's actually a destiny definer death and life are in the power of the tongue and there are at least 10 verses in proverbs chapter 10 that gives the contrast between the path to life and the path to death that comes from the way we speak yeah um it in a, again in proverbs chapter 10 death and life are in the power of the tongue that's not saying that your words are like magic and that they create your, you know, they create your future. That's not what it's talking about at all. It's talking about how you can literally like shoot yourself in the foot, or how do they put it? You, you open mouth, insert foot. You can literally cause destruction in your own life by by your words, not because you've said things like, "Oh, I'm sick. I have the flu," and somebody, "Oh no, no, you've just cursed yourself. Don't say that." You know, and that's not what it's referring to at all. Instead, it's it's destruction through. Gossip, lying, deceit, you know, things like that. That's what this is referring to. <clears throat> yeah, so it's, it's, something's up with um, with Brian Houston. And, and what I mean by that, you know, kind of circling back and making my point, I, it takes some pretty crazy um, hermeneutical gymnastics to take Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 15, and make it about you uh, being on the path to kingdom destiny in this life and, you know, achieving your kingdom purposes. That is not what this text is about at all. In fact, it's such a bad Bible twist that you know, I'm literally left scratching my head wondering, what 
is going on with Brian Houston because now I'm beginning to see a pattern emerging. Every time I check in with him, it's as if he is purposely and deceitfully making sure that he does not, under any circumstance, preach repentance and faith and trust in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Instead, it's uh, he's making a, a very concerted effort to twist and mangle God's word in such a way that you don't see what those passages are really saying. Again, the only word that I can come up with for this type of behavior is it, it, it's satanic. So what do you think? I'd love to get your feedback. If you'd like to email me regarding anything you've heard on this edition or any previous editions of Fighting for the Faith, you could do so. My email address is talkback at fightingforthefaith.com or you can subscribe on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash 